Hello. Hello, hello. What's up, everyone? All right. Yes, Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. Go Zaddies. This is also a reminder that it's Father's Day. <laughs> Go call your dad. Hey, Loafs. Yeah, I hope uh, Czech will be contacting you. Bench of the Men, what's up? Fulpri, DK. Sandwich Enjoyer, Coacher. I am 145, Judd White. What's up? What's up? Hello, Eddie. Yes, happy Father's Day. Happy day three of the candidates. Go, Moj. Hello to Lethbridge Chess in the chat. Caught this. What's up? What's up? All right. Cheers. Morning coffee. Cheers. I guess it's not the morning technically, but. When you wake up, that's the morning. Yeah, there's some games still going on right now in the um, in the candidates. Four games every day. I think one of them is uh, already completed, and then there's there's a few more still happening. Um, I thought we'd just check over the one that's already finished and then uh, see if what's still going. He required ransom. Yeah, this game didn't have much in it, so uh, you know this is more like more like getting a weather report of what happened because not much happened here. Right, so we can breeze through this one. Rajabov Nepomnishi. My predictions, by the way, might come true. I predicted Ding would win, and all the other games would be draws. So that might happen. This one I thought was a categoric draw. Rajabov with the white pieces, in general, I feel like is always a safe bet draw. Um, because he is a very strong player. He doesn't take a lot of risks. I think he is vulnerable with the black pieces. But when he has white, like if he, <laughs> if he wants to draw, I feel like it's sort of there um basically had this catalan i mean sort of like queen's gambit just declined but catalan style and after dc4 i mean there's a whole bunch of theory that you can find in uh in this particular line but d takes c5 uh shall we say not the most ambitious that's uh that's like a commentary ism Someone says, yeah, that, it wasn't the most ambitious move. It generally means, like, this guy didn't want to play chess today. <laughs> That's pretty much what that means. D takes C5. That's not, like, it's just a forced draw or anything. But certainly, Jan is not, uh, not concerned when he sees D takes C. Salakai, thank you for the raid, dude. Welcome, welcome. Copycat, yes, exactly. Copycat speedrun. C3, I think the only thing worth taking away from this game, I mean, hey, if you play the Catalan, like, you know all about this, but there's, uh, there's something to be said for not letting your pawn be captured and instead giving it away. Um, and if you play this opening, this is like a really standard move, so you probably... You know, this is like falling on deaf ears, but I think it needs to be repeated. Uh, you know, say it louder for the people in the back. If black castles here and white goes knight takes c4, I don't think that this opening is resident sleeper. I think that white has a huge advantage. If you compare the pieces, you know, this bishop compared to this bishop is it's not even a discussion. 
And this bishop will always be at least equal to that one. The rook will get to c1, and black's pieces are really awkward here. So, yeah, the, uh, the move c3 is, like, really important to actually keep the valuation closer to equal. c3 takes, castle, and, I mean, white still has something to play for, but not too much. So that's probably the only really relevant thing from this opening. Because you can see trades everywhere. Uh, white is still a bit better here. But now the pawns are equally weak on both sides. There's been lots of trades. And after bishop e3, knight e5, c5 played. Talk about resident sleeper. And I take c3. Now, white probably can try to play with rook d2, but I don't think there's much here. And this is one of those positions which I actually think is pretty useful to play if you're ever like actually trying to train chess um, or like study a position. I think the current position after rook d2, technically, white is supposed to be better here. A little bit better. It's definitely a dead draw, but in blitz, I would say black is winning here. <laughs> black is winning. You know, just save the knight and you win in blitz. You know, the knight is such an annoying piece. But in classical chess, white's gonna play probably f3, king f2, maybe g4, start to put all the pawns on light squares. This pawn is a bit annoying. The bishop should be better than the knight with pawns on both sides of the board. Slightly better. So it's just one of those positions that's probably useful to train. Um, bishop against knight because I don't know about you guys, but my instinct is always that in a position where it doesn't look like it matters, I'd rather have the knight just because it's easier. But um, I think the, the better, the stronger you get at chess, the more you appreciate how a bishop can be a stronger piece than a knight even in a position like this. So, interesting, but obviously at this level, and if you're playing the game this way, you're not really there to try to prod around for some minuscule advantage that hardly exists. He just takes it, and we see pretty much an immediate draw. Not much there. Not much there. All right, so that's the game that has concluded already. Just so uh, we're on the same page here. Not much happened. Nepal Nishi, hey, he's, uh, he's got the black pieces here. He's fine with the draw. Rajabov staying solid as well. Neither player really had a shred of a winning chance here, so. Why did they bother playing this game? Ah, just keeping up appearances, really. <laughs> because, yeah, there's just no other, no other reason. All right, so the games that are actually occurring and, you know, relatively interesting. There's um, Faruja Naka, Fabi Duda, and then we have Ding against um, Mr. Rapport. Um, so... Let's just uh, start at the top here. I thought this was going to be one of the most exciting games of the round. I think we all did. What did you guys think of this game so far? Has anyone uh, taken a look at it, watched it live? Um, I pretty much skimmed through it, but I haven't really looked at it yet. Um, the interesting thing about this one is that this line, D takes C4 in the Nimzo, this is one of the, <laughs> this is one of the oldest lines. Like... This is really explored theory. So the fact that, um, and when I say it's explored theory, I mean that it's been proven to be very good for black. And white pretty much doesn't play it as a serious attempt to win anymore because black has done such a good job. Um, yeah, because black has done such a good job basically proving that there's nothing for white here. Hey, Tongmi. Ralph, JT. So the fact that Feruja brought out this opening 
and chose this specific one, not just against Naka, but in general, means that he had very good prep, uh, very deep prep, for sure. Because you can't, you simply can't play this line as white without tons and tons of prep and maybe a new idea. Because black has everything kind of figured out. All right, so that's why I was kind of excited when I saw this, because like either it's going to be a boring draw, but I don't think that's why Perugia didn't play two games with the black pieces, suffering to give someone an easy game with white when he has white. <laughs> okay, queen e7. Now, this is all pretty standard stuff, and I'm wondering where it sort of gets into new territory because I just realized these things are wrong. Take these filthy these filthy evals off. Um, but as far as I know, this is pretty much standard. Um, lots of ways to play it, by the way. So this is another like pretty old main line. The idea with queen a4 is that the knight is protecting the bishop. You might be wondering, like, we're breezing through these moves. This is all theory, very explored. The bishop is being attacked by the queen. So if I just play my bishop or my queen here, then black can play knight d7, develop very normally, and it's annoying for white. You can't play e3 without forfeiting your castling rights. So white says, okay, clever. I'm going to go here. Now you can move your bishop back, but then I can finally play e3, bishop e2. And after queen a4, if you don't go back, well then the knight is tethered to this bishop, so you can't develop your knight normally. So black in this position usually goes queen d7, saying, look, this is exactly where my knight wants to go take me. And now white goes queen c2. So it's like, why the hell did I give black an extra move? Well, that's kind of the square the knight wanted to go to. Plus, maybe the pawns can be doubled here against the king now. So the queen is actually worse on this square than it is on the original d8 square. So all that to say, in the rook d1 line, the same principle applies with queen a4. And white chooses not to go with knight there and bring the rook in, which works a little bit better against the move c5. If you already have a rook here, then c5 is going to be a bit more uncomfortable for black than if you have knight there. Black can sometimes go c5 straight away. So rook d1 is a little more fashionable. Queen e7, knight f3, and as soon as we get to the move e4, um, again, this is this is pretty serious stuff here. So e4 was played. e5, definitely uh, intended. When you see these pieces like this, permanent pin, right? This is going nowhere. Doesn't matter what black does. Um, e4, e5 is, is going to hit like a truck here. Which means the only way to, to deal with it is going to be an eventual g5. There's no way that move doesn't get played. Okay, bishop f1, rook f1 is going to happen. And then here we see the move g5. If you don't play g5, I just don't see how you deal with this. Keep in mind that when you have the queen here, um, the queen gets hit. So there's no way that you can do this tactic sometimes where your knight gets hit and then you hit the bishop. Sometimes you'll see this. I think it's pretty common in um, some of those openings where... How does it go? Let me flip there. Uh, I'm trying to think of a good example of one. It's a good example of one. Hmm. French lines. Yeah, that's what I was thinking as well. But like, <laughs> for some reason I can't really do it very well. Pawn is getting here. It would have to be like a pawn on e4. Can't really think of like how to put it on the board right now. Bishop here. E5 and then h6.
it's not like this isn't really like I mean it's it's what I'm talking about, but it's kind of a lame a lame uh move. Maybe bishop b4. <laughs> yeah, this is what I'm talking about, but I just I don't really think this is a line. Maybe it is. <laughs> It's kind of like weird. What the hell is this, right? E46, D4, D5, Knight, C3. Oh, well, that's what I just put on the board. Uh, be my, be my dado. But uh, I just don't think this is really a line. Maybe it is. This looks like a pretty lame line. Anyway, the idea is to play E5, and even though you're pinned, you can play H6. So you break the pin. But when you have a piece sitting on E7, whether it's a queen or a bishop or king or something. Then when you take this, you can't take that because you'll lose something here. But here it's okay. It, like this stuff is all right for black. Um, and that's pretty much what what we have here for um, for Hikaru. So he has a queen and rook lined up there. So e5 is always gonna like just take the entire house. So I think he was forced to play g5 here to get out of this pin, more or less. But this is, I mean, obviously prep. You're not showing up to the candidates, sacking a piece, and hoping it works against uh, Ikaro. Knight c6. Queen c1. So not the move that everyone <laughs> would probably play. e5. Um, first of all, I don't know what the lines are here. But e5 still even looks logical to me. So, <laughs> I guess knight takes. And if you take here, I guess you're just not, there's no checks. So you're just not getting there in time. Maybe queen b7 even. That looks like a good move. So yeah, you're just you're just not able to check the king or get the queen over there. So queen c1, threatening more of the same. And by the way, I think probably after this, you could move this queen somewhere, and it's still very tricky. Queen c3 or something. A4. Yeah. Don't know what the hell's happening here. This looks very sketch to me. I, I'm sure uh, this works out eventually for black, but I would be scared to death if I was playing a tournament game and someone played this as white. To even play knight c6 means that you've got to have this. You got to have this move figured out. Yeah, I, I like queen c1. It definitely looks... I mean, obviously, he's prepped queen c1, so no doubt queen c1 is probably a better move than e5, but I'm just saying e5 on its own looks pretty frightening. Queen c1. Yeah, the other thing, you guys maybe would know exactly where he spent his time, but I checked later, and Hikaru was down like an hour, an hour and a half or something, so I knew that he must have been deep in Ferruja's prep, and just trying to navigate things, and I, I'm very impressed by Hikaru because I don't think there's any, I don't think there's any position that feels tougher to be in as a classical chess player than when you're sitting at the board and you know, and you're just like, God damn, I'm so so tilted that my opponent definitely had the exact position that we're playing on his computer in his hotel room before he got here. And you just know it. You know that you're not even playing your opponent. You're playing against literally the engine. And it's such a frustrating feeling. Because if you make a move and your opponent replies very quickly, like if Hikaru moves and Ferruja makes a move immediately, are you supposed to feel good or feel bad? Number one, you feel good because you probably made a move that the engine thought of, which is why Ferruja knows it and he's playing the next move. So you probably made a very good move. On the other hand, it's your turn again. <laughs> so you gotta think all over again. So you're there spending 20, 30 minutes on, on one single move. Your opponent spends like 10 seconds. 
And you're like, okay, great. Well, I guess I just got to do that again and again and again and just play perfect moves until maybe you earn a draw or maybe you're slightly better if you play the engine line perfectly. But it's a very frustrating position to be in. So I, I credit Hikaru for navigating these waters. Rook takes d4. Takes. There's no pawn takes because of this. So knight takes. And then e5. I imagine just isn't as good as queen f4. You don't really need the pawn there. I'd rather have this pawn controlling light squares. Queen f4, I want to take and very simply, you know, deliver all sorts of mates. Now, if the king goes to e2, just do we just go back or what's the uh, what's the play here? Actually, after king e2, this is probably very important. The knight just goes to one of these squares. Knight h5. And then if queen g4. King e2. There might be some clever queen move here. What are we doing after this? <laughs> Not too sure. I mean, there's like queen here, and then queen b5 check. Does this work? Because I don't think so. I don't know. Knight c2, king e2. Like, sure, I can go back. But... Is this really the move? I thought maybe there'd be something more direct. I guess if king d1 here... You can go like this again. And you'll get your queen in there. Oh, but hang on, actually. I have this move. Yeah, wait. Wait a minute. Because there's not really any beautiful knight discovered check. Man, I really don't know. <laughs> These are like insane tactical lines. Check. King here. I'm not seeing anything because... Oh wait, is this not even mate? That's a good point. This isn't even mate. Wow, okay, so maybe black can just go like this or something. Because this isn't even checkmate, surprisingly. Probably have to take a draw here. <laughs> Very impressive. I thought it was me, like I just assumed, but this is... That's not me. Black's the one delivering mate here, so you might have to just take this draw with uh, queen g3 and queen there. The thing is, like, black's threatening mate in one, so I don't think white really has time to, you know, play queen here or anything. That's the problem, Judd White. Okay, so I guess it was more like knight c2, and if king e2, just knight back. He goes king d1, queen d7, and these must be only moves. I'm sure of it. And hey, if you're Ali Reza and you're coming in with this preparation and you get this position, you have to be stoked. Like, this is as good as it gets.
This is as good as it gets. I don't think so, Jed White. That's the point. Black does it all with checks. Threatens meat. I, there's just no way to get to h6. The best white can do is make this draw or play queen h6, but it's not check. And then black will mate you or check you at the very least for a draw. So you're either getting a draw as black by perpetual, 100%, or you're probably mating white if he tries to play a move like queen h6. It's just too slow. Thanks for the four months. Visionary mind. With Prime, DC please, two months with Prime. Boop Lord 430, five months with Prime. Welcome, welcome, welcome. But this is great, right? This is this is like all-star preparation. It's you're not up anything. Two pawns, two pawns, knight for bishop. Bishop is better than the knight. What have we been talking about? Pawns on both sides. Still, it's tough to play with a, a bishop always. Knights are tricky. Um, but Ali Reza is going to get you know his pawns pushed up the board. Very impressive stuff. He targets the knight so that he might be threatening to take here. And white should be very happy. White should be very happy. You got two connected pass pawns on the outside of the board. Bishop against knight. I don't know what the eval is here, but I'm loving it for Ali Reza. This looks like really good preparation. And Hikaru hasn't even played poorly. It's just, just good prep. H6, cute move. Can't stop this pawn. Good stuff. Um, but it is a pawn on a dark square, which is never, never great to see. Um, the trick for advancing pawns is you usually want to advance your pawns on light squares and then have your bishop on the dark squares. So if I have a dark square, bishop is white, and my two pawns start down here. In general, the safest way to advance the pawns all the time, without thinking, is h3, g4, h4, h5, g5, g6, h6, h7, g7, g8. So... The pawns are either beside one another, or whenever they're split, briefly, they're split and they're on the opposite color of the bishop. That's always how you want to do it. Because if you ever have your two pawns starting here, and you play g3, let's say your opponent could put their king on g4, and all of a sudden your pawns j just get stuck. They can't move at all. But if I play h3 and my opponent puts their king on h4, I can use my bishop to check the king, and they'll have to go back, and then I can push my pawn, and if my king, their king is ever blockading, I can use the bishop again. So it's just like a really, really comfortable way to push. Um, it could basically happen here. Like, you know, I would go g5, but then categoric, awful, terrible, like, quit chess move is h6. Right? Voluntarily in this position, when you have the choice, if you play h6, tear awful move. Like you're throwing away any winning chance you might have had. g6, however, notice how the bishop controls the other square. So the king, you know, go like this or something. And then you might want to try to get your bishop to that square or that square to check the king. And if the king goes back, then you play h6 and h7, and then you'd be able to make a queen, because the bishop's controlling the squares that the pawns aren't. But as soon as you play h6, literally everything is controlling the exact same color, and black's king would just shuffle between these two squares, and you can't make any more progress. So um, that's how to advance pawns with bishops. The same thing, like, you know, forget about white's bishop. If black had a dark square bishop, then... I also wouldn't want to play pawn to g6. So let's pretend like white doesn't even have this bishop on the board and white has a knight. If black has a light squared bishop and I'm pushing my pawns, I also probably don't want to play h6 because then the light squared bishop is just going to cover all the, the squares that my pawns are not on. Whereas if I play g6, then I could use my knight to cover the, the squares that I don't control. And meanwhile, that bishop... It can't do anything when the pawns are on light squares. Like, it could sack for my pawns, but I mean, it can't control the other squares. So, um, 
In this particular case, Ali Reza was forced to play this move because it's probably the best move in the position. Like, it's not all, you know, roses and butterflies in chess. Your opponent's also trying to stop you from getting what you want. If Ali Reza could have played g5 and g6, <laughs> he would have loved to. He would have loved to. But he just can't do that. So h6 was played for tactical reasons. They get into this endgame. And after g5, if black puts the king there, there's nothing, nothing going on. King g6. So Ali Reza plays h7, which is huge, a huge step for him. And g6. This is ideal for Ali Reza. Ideal. Right, this is as good as it gets. Pawns are on light squares, and you have a dark square bishop. Perfect. Because if the bishop ever gets here and checks the king, it's exactly what I've been talking about. The pawns are going to queen because they've, they've, they've arrived at literally as good as it could get. The only thing better than this would be if the bishop was already there, and then you played h7. But the process of getting that bishop to that square is quite difficult and quite involved. And if it was very easy to do, then white would be winning. <laughs> the game would be over. Naka played c3, which is a very good move. Someone said that they were very impressed Naka played uh, c3 with 10 seconds on the clock. Um, but c3 was move 41, just so you know. So Naka had an hour and 10 seconds to play c3. <laughs> Not 10 seconds. Um, it looks like a very impressive move because in general you want to liquidate. <laughs> yes, he played it in 10 seconds with over an hour. Okay. Then, then I would say to anyone who's admiring that, please don't copy that. Hikaru is just a, he's like a, a calculation machine, dude. You are not. So if you have an hour and 10 seconds, in this position, please use your goddamn time. <laughs> that is not something to idolize. <laughs> oh yeah, Hikaru had an hour and, and 10 seconds and he made a, a move which is the most critical and could have lost in the game and he made it in 10 seconds. Wow, my hero. No, <laughs> don't do that. That is very bad for you. <laughs> and you will probably ruin a lot of your games by doing that. <laughs> so... Power to Nakamura, he can do that, but not something to emulate. Um, however, yeah, C3 looks like a very strong move. <laughs> very strong. Um, and I imagine uh, Faruja's just been in the tank ever since. Larissa, thanks for the 15 months. Welcome back, Larry. So let's say takes, takes, king c2. Black is going for some sort of like fortress type thing. Um, this move is about to win the game, by the way, because you get a queen. So I imagine the knight has to return here. And then if king d3, you walk into this knight fork, and there's no way that white... Um, that white should win that. Sometimes these positions are like a little bit tricky, but it, it really shouldn't be. I think this is simpler. If the king gets here, then the game's a draw. Anyway, yeah, you're definitely not worried about losing that. So, white can't touch that square. However, this bishop can definitely move. Let's say bishop h4. If knight here, then bishop f6 check happens again. So the knight's kind of stuck. So, first of all, if 
e5. Bishop here. Are we hanging on because we have knight f4? I think that's that's the case. And we'll take this. It's impressive. I think you have to play e5. Because basically if white plays here and here, game ends. I think the game ends. Does black have b4 ideas? Yeah, the problem though with b4 is, okay, take, let's say you take, right? And you have to go right back because bishop f6 is going to win. Then I'll move my king, let's say here. You have to go back. And then I'll play bishop g3, and I, I think I might be winning here. Because I don't know what you do about this move, honestly. You just pre-move this. No matter what knight move they do. If they take here, you're just promoting. I don't know, this looks lost. So, is it the case that there's only, only one resource? Is that when white tries to do this, black is going like that, and blocking it with knight f4. I think that's the only way to draw. If bishop a5 for the exact same threat, e5, bishop here, and again, you're winning in all these lines as white, unless black plays some very specific moves. Takes, takes here, and then b4. Is that what we're looking at right now, Judd White? Because yeah, apart from this, bishop a5 is the only other try. But this is obviously in time here. Not even close. So I will tell you one thing. Um, if, if the pawns were further back, there's a chance that it's losing. So, like, basically, if, I'm trying to say if these pawns were all, if everybody was, like, one square back, it might be losing because you take and go promote. But the other idea that white has in some of these lines, which is not going to work here, is it's very close to working. Is you queen, and then you play here, and you force mate. It's force mate in three. But in this particular case, it's not going to work because you cover it by queening. So even if this you made a queen on almost any other square, not this or this obviously, but even this square, any other square, and you would lose to this like check check mate. Um, but the queen on a1 is uh, is perfect because it covers it. So white even has an idea to do that, which can work a lot of the time. If you push your e-pawn, for example, then I make a queen, and I go king here. And it's it's quite beautiful. Like So that's another idea to keep in mind that is only not working because black gets a queen on a1. <laughs> it's pretty crazy. Eleven months cripple pawns. Thanks for the prime resub. Ignore the capture on b4. Yeah, so bishop here. This is the line we were looking at. Um, we were ignoring the capture here, and we were just trying this, and it's still, it's just not enough. Just not enough. Um, And if we sit around and do nothing, like bishop here, then there's no threat here, and black has time to play one of these knight moves and grab that pawn. And once you take that pawn with the knight, the other one immediately falls, and you should be able to make that draw. So Los was saying the only other line um, that I think is relevant here, which is we've tried this, this, no other squares available. So bishop g5, not threatening to go 
immediately like that, but um, there's a long way that we could end up on that diagonal, plus we could maybe force the king into the corner with bishop h6. So, bishop here, and let's say e5 gets played. Maybe there's time for b4 there because of this move. b4 might be, I'll come back to b4, but let's say you play e5. Bishop h6 forces this. Now, if you go here. I don't think you can go here because of this. So knight e7 or knight f4 look like immediate, immediate moves. You just pick up this. Um, and if you wait, maybe, with, like, king here. Because if you move, as soon as you move the bishop, the knight goes here or here. That's the issue. Actually, you don't even need to move the bishop. Black's threatening to go here, even right now. Oh no, sorry, not, not yet. Bishop f6. So if the bishop goes this way, it just the bishop has to go in these two squares. But if as soon as it leaves this diagonal, then I just play this. So black needs to make a move here. Is this one fine? Just king h8. The issue with bringing the king up is that I think knight f4 hits you all the time. So you can't bring your king up here, and as soon as you bring your king up to d3, this move gets slapped down on the table, I think. And it's a fork, and then you lose those two pawns, and then it should be a draw. So you can't use this square. So the only way to advance the king is literally like, not even here because of that, like, it's literally like the longest. <laughs> but by the time you do that, believe me, black's going to do something here. Okay, takes, takes is played. It's so crazy because this end game, like, it screams winning for white. Because, like I've been explaining, the pawns, both on light squares, with a bishop, threatening in one move to win the game, almost at all times. Pretty impressive that it's not winning, honestly. King Crucify, thanks for the two months. Appreciate you, buddy. That's right, Gargoyles. Yeah, this is all on the board. But this isn't very surprising, right? This is what we just looked at. Now, you don't have to play king c2. I could start with this. I'm not sure it makes a huge difference. No way white would accept a draw. Well, white is eventually going to accept a draw if, if it goes, yeah, if it gets played out properly. But yeah, no way white accepts a draw here. <laughs> That'd be insane. Gotta make your opponent play it out, make them prove it that they know what they're doing because only black can lose this game. Bravo, Charlie Romeo. Have you been watching our analysis? What do you mean bishop d4 is winning? Like, sure, if you wanna pick it up and throw it on d4, it's winning, but that's the whole point of the end game. Of course, white is trying to get a bishop here to give a check and win the game. It's what we've been analyzing for the last 15 minutes. But there's no good way to do that. Black is going to play e5 and then bring a knight somewhere and take this pawn. You're going to lose both of these. Hello, real black queen. Yeah, Ali Reza with the white pieces, Hikar with black. 
Um, Fabian Duda just drew. Yeah, Fabian Duda, this is some theory as well. Like, this whole thing is theory. Literally, this entire opening to like here is theory. And even still, I think it's fair to say even this is basically a theoretical position. 22 moves deep. Very equal. Again, you could make the argument that Bishop's slightly better than the Knight, but not a serious argument. I think Duda kind of outplayed Fabi in this game. Rerouted the Knight nicely. Got a favorable pawn structure where the pawns got fixed on light squares. So I think um, I think Duda just played a tremendous game. Ooh, interesting. C5. That could be a an important move to maybe save a draw. Activating the king. Impressive game. Not a lot of winning chances for either side, honestly. But I thought Duda Duda should be pretty happy with the game. I think he outplayed Fabi. And Fabi's opening led to pretty much nothing. The pawn majority on the queen side wasn't felt at all. I thought not only did black neutralize white's apparent perceived edge, but he might have even been playing for something himself at some point. So I think, uh, I think Duda played really well. So a draw there. Um... King C2, Knight D5 were played in this game, but we kind of expected that. This game, my goodness, I swear to God, I looked at Ding, like his game, and I, I thought it, I, I saw an eval of like plus five. Like, I swear I saw plus five. What the hell happened here? Okay, pretty standard Grunfeld. Bishop g5, knight d4. So report sacks the exchange. I get it. Like, it's. Th this looks pretty dicey for white. There's a lot of stuff hanging. But still, ding, calm, cool, collected goes h5. h5 is a big alpha move, by the way. Your opponent sacks material. Not only is there a rook lined up to your queen, there's like a bishop loose. There's all these knight checks and forks to worry about. And in this position, you just play h5. That's, that's sick. h5 is a, a big time move. Yeah, back to back six hour games are pretty brutal, P more. It's definitely happen, happened to me in my career. What do the bars mean? Uh, the bars are uh, how much time they spent per move. So if you hover over it, it actually tells you like right there. It's very small. Maybe you can't see if it says 527 and 1033. So it just means that white took 5 minutes and 27 seconds to make their move. And black took 10 minutes and, and 33 seconds to make their move. So white took 5 minutes, played h5, then black took 10 minutes, played bishop e5. And then, obviously, at the start of the game, right, literally, like, yeah, just almost no time to make these moves. Pretty much instant. Um, anyhow, okay, a4, king g7, king f1, getting out of the knight checks, important. a6, I think it was right around here that apparently Ding had like a massive advantage. Um, I wonder why though. Because it's nothing to do with this. Obviously white's ahead. But if these pawns trade off, I would wager it's very close to a draw. So it certainly has to do with keeping the pawns. So here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking it has something to do with winning the B pawn. So queen e2, queen has to go somewhere that guards the bishop. 
there's only two squares available. So let's say, I mean, this doesn't necessarily look good to allow that move. So let's say here, take this. And what about queen e3? Just out of curiosity. Maybe there's even a better move like queen b5 or something. Yeah, maybe queen b5 is just like a simple version of that. Because if the bishop has to go back here, like, surely this is a winning endgame for white. Nah, I'm not even going to waste time here. This is winning. And after you go queen here... Uh, okay, I guess black has this move. True. True. Yeah, okay. Fair enough. Queen e3 also exists, by the way. <laughs> yeah, but what, what's really coming after queen d2, though? Or queen e2. Like, that's what I'm wondering. Like, okay, queen e2, you can tell me it's a great move, but why? Like, it definitely feels good, but I'm trying to think why. Is it possible that an endgame like this is winning? No way, right? It's like too suspicious. 23, queen takes d8. Queen takes d8 looks crazy risky. <laughs> I don't know. I'd be scared shitless. <laughs> you guys want queen d8 and queen g5? looks like some fucking crazy shit geometry bro i mean okay <laughs> i was gonna say queen e4 looks pretty scary but this is mate so you have to justify this with h6 and mate and with the fact that this is one of the strangest things i've ever seen queen d8 and if queen e4 first, let's just take. This looks pretty damn scary though. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess if you guys are bringing it up, I assume <laughs> I assume you guys have done the homework. I guess this is a very good move for white. But I would be pretty concerned about, I mean, I guess this doesn't work, but queen e4 still looks concerning. Maybe this works, but fuck me. <laughs> that looks pretty scary. So anyway, yeah, this looks scary, and just the whole idea of even taking a queen g5 does look pretty tough. Queen g5 here looks like a, like possibly an elite move, guarding this. Yeah. Yeah, that is a weird one, for sure. That looks like it does the trick. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. He just took, he didn't even think twice. But I'm saying here, the way Ding played it, this should still be winning. I'm just wondering what... Um, 
I'm wondering what he missed, really. Like, what idea he missed. Man, Ding just... <laughs> Ding just fucked off from that. He was just like, screw this dude, I'm going home. Just took that bishop, said fuck this. I don't want to waste my time. But for sure, there's some there's some coordination here that black doesn't have. That's what I'm uh, curious uh, about. What did he miss here? Plus seven. I don't even believe this. Yeah, what? It's not plus seven. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Plus seven, okay, play it. <laughs> okay, that's what I thought. I was like, dude, I'm not seeing anything, like, specific. <laughs> okay, but anyway, definitely this looks like a good move. Okay, takes, takes. Yeah, but this one's not that comfy, Loafs, right? Because this pawn needs to be defended by the bishop on this diagonal. And there's always going to be some a5 business. Like it's, it's not fully... It's a little weird. Just that the bishop isn't on that square yet, either. So, like, if the queen's disappeared here, I feel like I would wager that this is winning for white. Rook d7, and then, like, bring the king. I just don't see this bishop establishing itself very easily. Yeah, that was actually a debate, like, legit. Plus six, like, go fuck yourself. <laughs> Plus six, okay. <laughs> Jed White, thanks for the 5,000 bits. For the Kokomo Fund. What is the Kokomo Fund? <laughs> is this a, is this an internet meme that I don't know about? Maybe it's like one of those, uh, you know, these nuts things, like Kokomo these nuts on your face. <laughs> um, what's happening in this game? It's the only one that's going on here. Yeah, so they just drew very quickly. Um, not much happening here, right? Yeah, okay. Literally nothing has changed since you last got here. The reason that... Um, the reason that we had um that we have hikaru pretty much blitzing at this point and ali reza not i mean you have to understand that hikaru doesn't have like in this position hikaru has one move oh, oh yeah let me turn these off so you can see there he has one move to play and in this position he has one move to play so it's not that hard <laughs> it's not that hard to play the only move in the position um Again, after bishop here, I think Hikaru is hard-pressed to... And this is why Alvarez is spending so much time. The guy probably spent tons of time analyzing these two moves. Realized it's just so easy for black to do this. He's going to maybe try some shenanigans with bishop h6. But at the end of the day, I think Hikaru is like... He's in this position no matter what. But for Alireza, he's in this position because he probably thought it was winning. And Hikaru just... You know, he's got to take what, whatever's in front of him. Whereas Ali Reza can still decide how he wants to play. But Ali Reza dictates the pace here. You know, the Bishop H4 lines. Hikaru has one idea in every single one. It's E5. He's got to play E5, and then he's getting ready to put his knight. And if that works as a defensive idea, it works. If it doesn't work, it's not like Hikaru can do anything different. That's the best he's got. So it's easier to calculate for black because he almost... I mean, you still have to calculate it, but you almost don't because there's nothing else to play. Whereas for white, you have a very serious choice to make between which move you want to play to try to win. But for black, the defense is the same against all of them. So, Hey, Valentinian. Did you stream last night, buddy? You had some good energy. Go, Val. Appreciate it again, uh, Judd White. But, um, lit yeah. Don't, didn't, don't even know what that is, honestly. 
Thanks for the support. Yes, we're here with the analysis. There's only one more game. Three draws today. Some interesting ones. Rajabov, super uninteresting. Fabiano, Duda, pretty uninteresting. H8, yeah. This is what this is what I was thinking that you know both of these moves are possible if this bishop moves in a certain direction. And if king e2, does this do anything? Yeah, knight f4, and you're just going to take this. So you can't touch this square or this square. You can go here, but eventually when you get too far this way, there's just going to be some A-pawn uh, coming at you. Well, so far, Mathisco, I haven't, I haven't met anybody who can tell me what Ding should have done instead. Is that the same as, are you that person as well? So far, I've just seen a lot of people being like, I can't believe Ding didn't convert, but also don't know how to convert. Like, what, what did he miss uh, specifically? Or what should he have done? Because I don't even know. It's a bishop and a pawn for a rook with not many pieces on the board. <laughs> Chess.com engine plus seven, and then you make the move that it says plus seven, and it's like, eh, actually, it's plus one. Gotcha. <laughs> Taco homie, thanks for gifting us up. Yeah, at this point, Violinist, uh, Naka doesn't have many options to choose from, but I am pretty impressed by this. This is like an amazing hold. He really suffered here. Like, Faruja's prep was phenomenal. He got the advantage he wanted. And it feels like he's done everything to win, but it's not enough. Like, this is, this is pretty impressive by Naka. This is, a, this is a good game by both players. What's up, Denmark? Yes, yeah, so there's only one more game left. Yeah, is the bishop dominating the knight or is the knight dominating the bishop? White doesn't really have an X move here, here Stu. Like, no matter what happens, black just kind of sits around. The only thing you can try that's different is like, okay, let's say here, this is, this is a move. I personally, like maybe b4 can be played here. Personally, I would say I'd rather wait for this king to be as far as possible this way and just go like this. Right, because you can't use any of these squares. Oh, sorry, I can go to f3. So here, I need to do something. So after king here, it's probably time for this. And how does this go? Takes a3. Gotta be this. Right, we get it. Um, here. Interesting. I don't think you can do this, can you? 
Uh, A2 is pretty nasty. That's amazing, huh? Unbelievable. Holy shit. To actually win. The pawn blocks this this uh, knight and the bishop covers the other two squares. It's fucking amazing. So it actually is relevant. Where the pieces are. In here, and if you do it now with the king on that square, it doesn't matter at all. Because now you take here, because now you can't take here because of knight c2. <laughs> That's filthy. So on king e1, you have to go b4. It's amazing. Honestly, amazing. I guarantee that's how the post-game interview is going to be as well. It's, like, it's just amazing. What do you mean, Logan Chan? What temp tempi? It to me, it doesn't matter where the king is here. It's more about White's king being here. And if the White king steps on either of these squares, Knight f4 draws, or maybe even wins for Black immediately, because you have b4 and too many pawns. So if you can't go to these two squares, you can't go to these two. Right? You can't go to this one. The only way to the other side of the board is King e1. So it doesn't matter where my king is. At some point, you have to play this, and as soon as you do. This move gets played. White cannot threaten to get on this diagonal in one move, because they're all taken. So you must take. Then black goes here. Now, again, if, if black goes a2, he's going to win the game. So you don't have an option here. You have to play bishop there. And then after knight takes, you can't take this because of that. So you must play something like, I don't know, let's say king e2. Right? So now you could be threatening to take. But let's say black wants uh, their draw here. All they need to do is go like this. Put the knight on one of these squares, take the pawn, and make a draw. So king e1, b4. Yep, that's a, yep, that's another one. Bishop c1. I think just take. I don't think there's anything happening here. Just take it. Just take these pawns. So, I think you try king e1, but yeah, I mean it's the only attempt. And it's very interesting that, let's say you don't play b4 and you play this. King f2. Now, king f3 is threatening to really win the game. So you, you definitely can't allow that. So now you got to pull the trigger on this. It's too late. And now, here, here. And if you go a2, then this move. And now you're screwed again. And... Knight takes b4 doesn't work the same way. There's no tricks. Wait, 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 wait. There's knight d3 is what I'm just looking at now. Maybe it does work. Uh, knight d3 here, actually. Huh. 
Yeah, maybe that is okay, actually. I feel like I'm missing something. I could always throw in a bishop h6. Maybe this is, uh, like, a good thing to do. It's hard to tell. Throw that in. He played b4, so it, it, this discussion doesn't really matter, but I think that there's a difference between the king here and king here. Yeah, the thing is, bishop f8 doesn't really do anything. The king just goes to h8. What am I missing? Hm. I don't know. Maybe this? No, but you just... Okay, maybe this is somewhat tricky. Yeah, I was thinking like this. <laughs> anyway, the game was b4, a3, yeah. And this will just be a very, very easy draw now. Easy draw. Watch the live game. Dude, the live game doesn't, <laughs> doesn't fucking matter. Like, the only interesting part of the game now is what's not happening. That's what, that's what you really appreciate chess for, is you look at this game now and it's like, okay, it's pretty boring. Like, everybody's just capturing shit. There's not, uh, there's nothing to appreciate anymore, but it's everything that does not get played, which is what they spent their entire time calculating and mutually agreed was not anything. That's, uh, that's really what's impressive. Like all the lines that we just analyzed, where like somebody was winning by one single move and then you have to figure out exactly how to retrace your steps and get rid of that single move so that it's a draw again. That's the difficult part of chess. This is like, <laughs> this is the boring part. Well, Ali Reza should look a little bit disappointed like, like he lost the game because Karo just defended like a madman and uh, you know, you're always disappointed as a chess player when you have some fresh new idea preparation wise. Because you always want it to pan out. You want it to be worth something. Like, who knows? I, you guys might not know this, but... Ali Reza may have... found this idea... five years ago. It's very common for chess players to find an idea in an opening that might yield some kind of advantage or it would be really tricky and just never have a chance to play it or they want to save it for like a really important game for years and years and years and there are a lot of uh, examples of world championship matches where somebody plays a move that they've been saving or that someone found like a decade ago so you can imagine the disappointment that something you've been saving and you really believe is like that strong for a long time you finally get to play it and someone just defends like insane it's not like you feel like you absolutely deserve to win and it was it was like a, a guaranteed point for you but you feel like it was a pretty good try and it's just disappointing to run into someone who's also playing extremely good defense that day so no i don't think um i don't think he's legit too upset, you're not going to win all your games, but he's probably just frustrated. I don't think he's at that stage, Kiloku. That would be pretty insane. It's only round three, and Ferrugia has had more... He's had the black pieces more times than he's had the white pieces, and he has one and a half out of three. And trust me, the guy's not upset. But he's just a little frustrated that he didn't get... He didn't get um, a full point. He played an amazing game. Like... We can say that about both players here. But 
in modern chess to generate an advantage in an opening that there is no advantage in, which is what Ali Reza just did, is extremely, it's, it's literally the hardest thing to do in chess. And he just did it, so he's got to feel proud about that. But for him to do that and then not win the game is frustrating. Because like, well, fuck, what do you want me to do? <laughs> this line was supposed to be a draw and I just created an advantage. And it's still not enough to win? God damn. <laughs> Do they have interviews? What is that on like on the twitch.tv slash chess channel or something? That was a that was an extremely uh I thought it was a fun end game. I thought Naka defended out of his mind, but I also thought Farouche's prep was, like, world class. There were so many lines where it was just drawn by, like, one, one move, one idea, one tempo. You can only do so much in chess. <laughs> Ali Reza really laid it all on the table there, but he just he ran up against the brick wall. Good offense, better defense. So all draws today. Considering like Ali Reza could have won, Ding could have won, all draws, but certainly not boring, all boring draws. Do I still have doubts about Hikaru's chances with the black pieces? Uh, de definitely. <laughs> if Hikaru has to play at this level every time he has the black pieces, he's gonna he's definitely not gonna draw every game. Like if he's under pressure like this every time he has the black pieces, it won't happen, of course. But let's say he is, that's not good. <laughs> he had to work really hard this game. So it's not like me seeing this game would make me all of a sudden be like, oh yeah, Nak is fine with the black pieces. Look at him. It's like, no, if he has to work this hard, that's a really bad sign. If he has to do this every game, there's no way he keeps it up. This, is, this takes a lot of energy out of you. He had to play so accurately this whole game. Um, but it's, it's an encouraging sign. I don't think he's going to be in this position every time. He's probably going to have other games where he has chances to win with black, but... In general, a draw, you're always happy with well, the, with the black pieces. Like, you're always happy to make a draw, so. Bazmaniac, are you going to join the club of players who said that Ding should have won without any idea how he should have won? Or do you know the answer to that question? So far, there's just been like hundreds of people being like, I can't believe Ding didn't win. Does anyone know how he should have won? What did he miss? What should he have done? All I'm seeing are engine warriors. Well, actually, Ding had an advantage, so Ding should have won. How, how do you do it? How do you win it? Does anyone know? I haven't, I haven't come across someone who has the answer yet. Like, okay, it's just a draw. Like, he sacked the rook at the end because it's literally just... A draw like blacks achieved everything but what, what did he miss Thanks, Chesscom. DE with the raid. Set the uh, 
Chess Calm Deutsch stream. Deutschland. The Germans. Welcome. Welcome. Who's doing the commentary, by the way, in the, uh, for the German stream? Who do they have work in that? <laughs> That's right, Java. No, thanks for the raid. Sean, yeah. Sean, yeah. Thanks for the four months, dude. There's no way they have Vincent Kamer doing it. Do they really? If so, that's goaded. <laughs> Michael, watch the German stream. Oh yeah, I forgot we can look at the uh um whatchamacallit. Next pairing. So there's a rest date tomorrow, by the way, but the day after that. Naka is blocking against report. Nipomnashi Feruja, Duda Rajabov, Ding Caruana. Man, it's actually double reverse? Vincent Kamer is doing the commentary on the chess.com uh, German stream? That is, is legitimately cool. <laughs> He's so strong. Yeah, Faruja gets black again. Like, poor guy. <laughs> if I swear, like, Faruja is just going to be a force to be reckoned with. If you give this man the white pieces, do you see what Faruja did today? To Naka? Like, it's impressive Naka's defense, but let's not forget, Faruja pressing as white like this, every time he has white, he's going to score some wins. He's going to. This man has been in a, <laughs> a chest cave for a year. He's got some serious stuff with the white pieces. I know for a fact. Yes, Naka has three blacks as well. Yep, two blacks in a row here. But yeah, Feruja with the white pieces seems ready to go. So hey, if Feruja keeps drawing with black and getting those chances with white, he's a force to be reckoned with in this for sure. I've been in a chess cave, yeah. When I was uh, going for GM, I was definitely in a chess cave for most of 2017. Definitely. So the next round will actually be not Monday, but the day after. Ding Caruana should be pretty high level uh, theoretical battle. Duda, Rajabov. I think Duda can really press here. Nepomnishi Feruja. Honestly, the way Nepomnishi's been playing, I feel like he's really gonna go for the, the throat. Like, maybe not intentionally, but the way that they're that his game against Fabi went. Nepomnishi does not stay. Like, let's say you watch a game that Duda plays. The evaluation in general does not stray, like more than a point in either direction away from 0.00, .00 in general. Of course, people blunder, but he's an extremely consistent player and he plays games where it's a very tight evaluation. Nepo's games tend to swing like two points in either direction sometimes, maybe more, um, just by nature. Not like he's intentionally doing it, just the type of moves that he likes to play and the chances he likes to take. Um, he has a more intuitive style, so <laughs> I think it could be a pretty exciting game, him against Ferruja.
But yeah, the Palm Nishi continuing to perform, it's impressive. A lot of people counted him out. You know, he didn't have a great score against Magnus, I get it. But he won the last candidates, and even if he can't beat Magnus at all, he's proving he can beat everyone else. My picks for the tournament, Caruana, Nepo, and Ferruja. Um, I definitely think Nepo can do it again. But we'll see. Long tournament, as it should be. Everyone gets white, everyone gets black against everyone else. Makes sense. Oh, I wasn't answering your question, P. Mark. I was just saying, I was just pointing that out in general. I don't, I don't know. I don't think in point totals. That's a kind of irrelevant stat to me. It's like, will the winner have 10 points or 6 points? Like, dude, I don't know. <laughs> I don't really care, to be honest. But those are my top three. Duke Nukem. Thanks for the tier three. A year as well. Full year from Duke Nukem. <laughs> Winner with six points, exactly. Six points, by the way. Thanks, Duke Nukem. Um... Yeah, but it's yeah, important to note that uh, tomorrow... I'll actually be doing uh, some commentary for chess.com. I think they have uh, this I Am Not a GM uh, tournament. So I'll be doing... Um, I'll be doing that tomorrow because it's the rest day. And then, uh, yeah, I'll be back doing more uh, candidates recap, analysis coverage. You guys kind of get the, the picture, right? Like, it's been the same every day. It's going to be like that for the whole candidates. I'm not going to have the stream on right at the beginning of the round. I need my sleep. You're going to appreciate my analysis more with a few extra hours of sleep. I promise you. <laughs> um, but I'll turn on the stream maybe when, like, one or two of the games have finished or mid-round, getting closer to the end of it. And uh, we'll just sort of check over. Check over every game that's happened together. Th this was a really fun game to analyze. I... I never know if you guys truly enjoy these positions where it's just so truly tricky. Um, like this endgame, Bishop against Knight that Ferruja and Naka just had. Like, do you enjoy the games where some people are blundering all over the place and it's just like a tactical shit show? Because uh, these, I have to say for myself, what we had today was definitely the definition of something... Can you imagine if Yasser was on the air with us? The guy would just be like, we'd be looking at that endgame for four or five hours. Like, <laughs> so much to take in there. And it's, it's definitely an endgame where I don't even know the exact outcome. Like, I, I don't have a compass there. Never seen something exactly like that. So, kind of have to figure it out on the fly, which is more fun. Because then we're kind of analyzing it all together. Thanks, Bell Colt. 29 months. Welcome back. Reliable Randy, 14 months. Uh, and Lil Sa. 11 months. Thanks, Lil Sa. Um, who's playing tomorrow? It's. Da, 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 da. Shuvalova and Canty. Yeah, round three is already over. All draws. Yeah, it's true, Lopes. Very disturbing. Very disturbing. As a, you know, as a chess purist, it's unbelievable that Black had resources there. Um, but very impressive. Uh, Fierce, I'll probably hang out for a bit. I'm not going to go as long today as I, I have uh, on some other days. I'll definitely hang out for a bit. I'll submit my um, predictions. Actually, uh, let me... Uh, may as well keep track of it since I'm doing it every day, right? So what did, what did we say? 
So round one. I'm trying to remember my predictions. I think I got two of them wrong in round one. I may as well keep track. So I think I said... Uh, I think I called this one like this. I definitely got two wrong here. It'll be uh, rad and rap. There we go. Yeah, huge Avs win last night. Big on the Avs. I can't remember what we called here. I think I called a draw here. And maybe I called like 01 here. No, there's no way I called Nepo. I probably did something like this. I definitely got two wrong and two right. Anyway, I really can't remember round one. I'm going to keep better track now. But I, I was definitely one out of two. Or sorry, two out of four. Correct. Round two. I think I said Naka for Javov. I think I said draw. Nepo Carwana. I definitely called for a Nepo win. Yeah, I think I did something like this. Two out of four, and today we were, uh, today we got them all except the ding win. There we go. I called a Firuja Naka draw, but definitely <laughs> nowhere near the kind of draw that we saw today. <laughs> Although you don't, uh, you don't pick what kind of draw it is. Okay, and we can make our um, round four predictions. Round four. Okay, report in Naka. Nepo, Feruza. Duda. Rajabov, Ding, Fabi. Um, I'm going to go Duda wins. I'm going to go draw, draw, and the surprising draw. As much as uh, this is a polarizing, someone is probably going to win this game, I'm going to go with draw. It's the same feeling I had about Ferruja Naka. It looked like an explosive game, but kind of fizzles out to a draw somehow. Yeah, these will be my, these will be my picks here. You think Ding could give Fabi the business? Yeah, I know there's uh, some people have been already quoting like what previous scores something like Ding has a big uh, lead against uh, Fabian classical but dude the, the form that Ding is in right now versus Fabi I think that also plays a, a role It's a whole new tournament it's all about how, what shape they show up in on game day I like Fabi's form at the moment I think it'll be fine um, bad chess good vibes thanks for the 20 months Rebecca Huge avalanche win last night, 7-0. Woo. Probably the worst score I think I've ever seen in the finals. I don't know if there has been worse, but that's pretty nasty. I have the Avs to win, so big result.
There you go, P-Mark, exactly. I'm not concerned about a 5-2 score. Doesn't matter. Okay, I'll keep this. I'll keep this. You don't think you've opened Notepad since 95? I think it's a stream thing. Like, if I'm, if I'm making something that I really need to keep, like for myself, like obviously I'll use like Docs or Excel or something, but if it's just a quick thing, and it's also, I'm doing this not for myself, I'm doing this for the stream because I don't really care what my predictions are, but because I started streaming all the games so far, I, I, I feel like, Maybe, may as well keep track of it. Could be interesting to know. Whose form is the most surprising to me so far? Well, I called Ding not being in form. I called Fabi and Nepo and Faruja being in form. Or like, I picked them to do well. Um, so, and D Duda, I said, is always consistent. I don't know, it's pretty early, so it's tough to say, but most of my like predictions or feelings are pretty much true right now. So, <laughs> what can I say, buddy? I'm just an absolute god. I'm a fucking beast. I called everything correctly, so uh, I'm not surprised by anything. I'm not surprised by anything. No comment on Nepo? What do you mean? Has Nepo done something worth commenting on? I, I said that I think Nepo is like a top three finisher for me. And he is playing that way so far. So I'm not surprised. It's early though. I mean like Nepo could lose the next game or something and then it's like, oh yeah, <laughs> you know. But it doesn't matter. For now, uh... For now, I think things are, uh, people are just getting their feet wet. It's a long tournament. Very long. Yes, less predictable, Eddie. Less predictable, Mr. Barber. Yeah. Ten more rounds. It's crazy, eh? Twice, Kermo. So there's eight players. You don't play uh, yourself, obviously. So seven games times two, because you play with both colors. Fourteen rounds. But the players get a rest day tomorrow, so they get a break, at least. They get a break. Am I interested in ever playing in it? No. No. It's like, if you just throw it at me and say, Hey, I'm on tomorrow, you can play in the candidates. I was like, what am I going to say? No, sure, I'll play in the candidates and get absolutely rocked by all the top guys. But your question kind of implies that I have to live my whole life with the candidates as a goal, put all that time and effort into only chess, probably like stop having sex for like 10 years, you know, stop streaming, like quit everything. <laughs> like it's just <laughs> so no, <laughs> that doesn't interest me at all. AKD707, welcome back for 38 months. I don't think so, Chess Ninja. Not quite yet. From now on, guys, if anyone, if anyone tries to make fun of you online, say that you, uh, 
you don't have sex, call you a virgin. Just let them know you're training for the candidates. Just getting an early start. Definitely P Mork, but not too many. Probably Ali Reza, Ikaru, and Naroditsky, I think, or like. There's maybe been a few other people, of course, but those are the main suspects that have gotten me 10 games in a row. Exactly, Judd White. <laughs> I, said it, I said it far less eloquently, though. Far less eloquently. Let's see. What's going on here? Who's online? Everybody's busy covering, uh, you know, covering the, the tournament, so. It's not that many, uh, not that many people here. Christopher Yu. Toronto's been good. Toronto is good. Slayer Zero. That's a good one. Aha. Got me chuckling, my dude. I thought I was diagnosed with sex daily, but really it was dyslexia. Eh, 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 eh. Uh, all draws today, Meta World Chess. All draws. be interesting to see how the games would go if the players could see the evals sort of interesting sort of interesting yeah not the moves but the evals i could see something like that maybe i should make a video like that you know chess ninja i'd really have to i'd really have to Maybe it hosts a bunch of unrated stuff or something. Anytime you're dealing with engine evals, can't have it rated, but maybe like a maybe we host a sub battle where the players get to know the evaluation. They don't get to know the move, but like, you know, let's say you're playing a game and then, you know, every so often you can check in and someone just tells you, you know. Plus 3.2, and that's it. That's all you get told. Plus 3.2. Wonder how that would affect the game. Do you think it would matter that much? I can definitely see how it would matter. Yeah, to an 800? No, probably not. <laughs> yeah, at 800. Buddy, it's plus 8. <laughs> Great. That ain't getting this king checkmated any faster. Yeah, we haven't done a sub battle in a hot minute. A lot of streamers um, have also been the same, but it's because like we did that sub battle league, if you remember, and it just it honestly took a lot out of me. Like that was supposed to be like a two to three month endeavor, and you guys probably remember it was called the summer, like summer league or whatever chess arena, sub battle league, and it, yeah. It was supposed to be like July, August, and it ended like almost in November, literally. Like, I, it just, it was a lot. It was a lot. I, I was a little uh, unhappy with, uh, with that. So <laughs> I needed to like cleanse for a while. But yeah, that, <laughs> that was pretty brutal. 
and just like coordinating these sub battles with other streamers it was like it was just getting to be a lot the uh dirty halvard thanks for the 300 bits buddy Am I unhappy that I look like a cat? No. Because I think the copycat speedrun is uh, worth. I'm okay being looking like a cat for that speedrun to exist. Rook takes e6, a sleazy? I think you're right. Oh, sorry, it's back here. Yeah, because the bishop covers the square as well. It's my cat personality. Do they have one of those? Do they have those? Yeah, I'm going to be playing chess next month, guys. It's no candidates, trust me. But uh, there's the Canadian Open. And I haven't played chess basically in three years. So I'm going to be doing that. It starts next month. That's our upcoming command. Um, July 12th. And hopefully, well, the plan is, but, you know, it's not fully set in stone. Hopefully we can um, cover it um, much the, the way that a lot of other people have been able to cover OTB tournaments. So, you know, DGT, webcam, if all goes well, and Eric commentating here on the channel. Well, no, Eric, the point is that I would play and Eric would commentate AKD. It's going to be very, very rare that Eric and I play the same tournament, just because it doesn't make a lot of sense. Like, if we're both playing, the only time that would happen, and the only time that has happened is, like, the Olympiad in the past, where we're on the same team. Um, because uh, it's, it's much nicer, usually, that you can cover the event, right, and stream it. So, others I care to mention? What do you mean, others? Other tournaments? No? I, well, I'll see how this one goes. See how it goes, and. Um, <clears throat> If it's uh, like if it goes um, goes well, then I might uh, might do more. Who knows? But I would never commit to more than one tournament because I haven't played in a while, and like if I don't enjoy it, I'm definitely gonna fuck off. <laughs> yeah, Eric's Eric's gonna be covering the tournament that I'm playing in, so it'll be like five six days in July, July twelfth to seventeenth. I won't be like going crazy studying for it, like studying chess, because at the end of the day, like I'm still going to be streaming. And this is why I haven't played chess in a while and why nobody does, because it's hard to still do your streaming job while doing that. But I will, I will prepare a little bit. I, I will try to show up with, uh, with a few new ideas. Well, AKD, you don't have to ask me, right? You can just look it up for yourself. 
the Canadian Open, there's a whole list of uh, players who are playing the tournament. Um, yeah, just Canadian Open Chess 2022. I think it'll. I think you'll be able to find the link there. Um, but they they po post the list of who's playing, so that will actually be better for you than me trying to think because I I can't remember all the people that are confirmed. But there's quite a long list, like some 200 plus players. Chances I play Knight A3 in the London? I won't say zero. <laughs> I won't say zero. But that would, that would definitely need to be looked at extensively. <laughs> Thank you, Shorgio. For the last comment as well. Yeah, I, I like... I've always liked hosting sub battles, but I just needed a break from them after the last experience, like coordinating with other people and having the event last like five, six months or something. It's just, it was a lot to deal with. <laughs> well, I've done it, Val. I've already done that. Um, it didn't go that poorly. And I, I'm saying that I did it not against like, you know, 2100 or something. I did it against a 2500 GM. Probably not the smartest. But I think once you do it once, that's, that's the shock value. Once. I don't think it has more in it than that. Yes, maybe J-Bell uh, can join the ranks. J-Bell, so far there's been a lot of... Uh, Keyboard warriors who've come in the chat and say, I can't believe Ding threw that game. Can't believe Ding didn't win, but yet have zero recommendations on how Ding should have won it or what specifically he missed or what he should do. Are you joining the ranks? Are you leading the charge as the GTA national master who's also clueless? Go oh, J Bell. Big armchair energy. It is McNaster, but you know, I would always contend that um it's nice to do your own thing. So I, I like dual commentary on sub battles with the person you're against, but not every time. I think it's nice to do your own thing, you know, for me to be able to like put music on when certain players doing it or you know, have our KO moments or me just getting like hyped over like a certain move or screaming at him to, to just go faster. And you just can't, you can't have those, uh, those moments that are like for your own chat, kind of the internal jokes, the inside jokes with your chat when you're on call with another streamer. So the, obviously it's kind of nice to have a mix of both, but usually I prefer to do my own thing. I think generally ninja you kind of like adjust yourself to the other person like if i'm with someone who's going crazy i'm gonna get crazier and if i'm with someone who's just kind of chilling i'm also gonna chill a bit more so yeah you kind of uh adjust but yeah i'll be playing chess uh, next month so there's that that's happening just under a month from now. And uh, you guys probably know that Eric's playing the Olympiad. Yeah, over the board optical. That's why we have the exclamation mark upcoming command. Um, Eric's also playing the Olympiad in India, representing Team Canada. So he's also going to be playing that, and I'll be able to do the commentary. So. There's, uh, there's a few different events. It's a nasty checkmate, eh? Yeah, it definitely exists, Loafs, but it hasn't been touched in a while.
Is this a charity stream? Not quite. But we ran a charity stream yesterday for uh, our friend uh, Czech. And uh, we made sure to disclose that we are definitely, definitely profiting off uh, Czech Manor of the charity case. One hundred percent of the proceeds go to us. <laughs> Gavo color? I don't know. Usually I don't wear the the chess bra merch when I play. It's a little unfair. You know, the plus 100 elo is too valuable at my rating. With great power comes great responsibility. J-Bell, I've already lived that life. I've already been a basement bra. I've done the grind where you play Canadian weekend tournaments every weekend, travel to like, like I remember 2014, I would travel to Montreal. I didn't even live there yet. I would travel to Montreal from my parents' house and sleep on Keith's floor. I didn't realize I was doing this at the time. Have you ever had a buddy say like, yeah, man, come on over. I got a place. Yeah, yeah you can crash for the weekend. And then you get there to crash, and they're, like, pointing to the floor. Like, when your buddy's like, yeah, you can crash, you don't assume they mean the floor, right? But that's what happened to me. <laughs> he was like, yeah, man, you can come crash, no problem. I was like, oh, wow, thanks. <laughs> and then he, like, gave me a pillow, and it, they pointed to the floor. <laughs> I was like, okay, I guess, I guess I'm doing this now. <laughs> Fucking funny guy, Keith. Hello, Keith. Keith is in chat. Do you remember that, Keith? <laughs> Hilarious. I, w I think I won that tournament as well, by the way. So shout out to Keith. He really gave me the right environment to thrive. I used my uh, winter jacket as a coat at the time. For warmth. For for heat to combat the hypothermia. Worst apartment of your life, eh? <laughs> yeah, that's pretty rough. That was pretty rough, uh, Mr. Keith. But we all start somewhere, eh? We, we literally all start somewhere. That's where it all started for Keith McKinnon. I was living off 7-Eleven taquitos and sleeping on Keith's floor. And winning the tournament. Canadian Weekenders. I was a real warrior at the time. Hello to Alan LBQ. How grandmasters are made. Alan, you weren't offering a bed at the time. Isn't this how, uh, isn't this how pornos start? Like, it's your fault, Alan, for not being available. I was a, you know, a young, you know, a financially unstable dropout. I might have needed a, a friendly face and a warm bed, but you weren't available, Alan. Unfortunate. A vulnerable white male. <laughs> but you weren't around, and that's uh, that's forever going to be on your conscience, brah. I, I really don't mind floor sleeping, Jed White. Like, I've slept on a lot of floors, but truly, the, the floor at Keith's place was like, it was like an elite floor. Like, when you, just, then when you think of a floor, this was it. It, it was a, a real floor floor, like, not remotely comfortable, 
no like little carpet it was like uneven tiling like not even, sorry not even tiling what's the shitty uh stuff uh it's like wood but what's the shitty stuff in uh like uh university like university housing linoleum huh <laughs> see it's that like i'm talking about that stuff let me let me look up linoleum Um, it's, yeah, it's linoleum, but, like, um, but it's, like, shitty linoleum. I don't know how to describe it. Here, here we go. It's this stuff. It's this stuff right here. You guys know what I'm talking about? It's just shitty, shitty flooring. It's definitely not nice. So if linoleum is nice, it wasn't that. <laughs> it looks not bad. I don't know how to describe to you. This is the worst kind of flooring you can have. This is a very nice, like, guys, look at this picture. This is Princeton University admission. So think of this. This is Princeton. Now... Take, take like a hundred levels down from this, the same floor done a hundred times worse, and it was that. I mean, this is Princeton. This is supposed to be nice. But I'm talking about the real rough stuff, like uneven, like... I think it's just a staple in those like uh, kind of ghetto areas near universities that most places have that shitty kind of flooring. Yeah, this is Ivy Leo. This is this is elite stuff. All, all of these pictures look really nice compared to what our good friend Keith was living under. Would I prefer carpet? Well, definitely. I've slept on carpet before, quite a lot. I've thought about this recently. I guess if you don't count my... So don't count the first 18 years of my life. After that, have I slept in a bed or not in a bed more often? And I think I've slept in a bed more often, but it's close. It's definitely like 70, 30, 75, 25, like... <laughs> Definitely not slept in a bed very, very often. Could be a floor, could be like a couch, a chair, standing up, on stream. <laughs> you know, I've definitely not slept in a bed a few times. During a chess game. Yeah, on stream, yep. <laughs> I'm really not I'm really not a picky person, Tom. I think it was a reaffirmation that it's not about the room you live in, it's about it's about the guy you're banging. A lot of lads made it down there. We had our lights down there as well, our porn lights. So basically, basically if you if you saw what Harry Potter lived in, 
it, it was similar. It was similar. So I didn't have a bed frame, and I had a mattress sitting on the floor, basically. So the entire time I was in Calgary, my mattress was on the floor. I don't, I don't think that's a big deal. Um, long term, sure, but like, I know I'm not going to be living in that house like for the rest of my life. And it's like, I don't know, it's just a phase. It was right by the stream room too, so I would just like stream and fucking roll into bed. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I don't think I could convince many Toronto ladies to <laughs> to roll into that bed with me. I think it was only feasible due to Calgary. <laughs> Calgary ladies, okay, okay. <laughs> Doable. What about now? Yeah, now I have a, a room with a bed and a frame and a raised off the ground with a three computer setup in my room. Yeah, okay. I'm 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 out of poverty. Rook F2 needed. Yeah, this move looks pretty nasty. It's a competitive game here. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I can do that, Gabo. You know? Getting, uh, by the way, what? Getting too old. Yeah, Gold Dirt Can. We just spent uh, an hour analyzing it. Pretty, pretty fun game. Oops. Oh, I guess the bishop goes here. I didn't see that. Yeah, I'm liking them today, Bill Barados. But honestly, I'm playing a few songs that I've like saved from previous streams. So I do like them, yeah. Sleeping on park benches between games, the Canadian way. If you've heard a song by Martin Karma and you can't find it on Spotify, then it might be like unreleased, but he's, for certain songs, he's given us permission to play it. So that could be the case. Is that right, Knight, Knife F5? It is Father's Day. It's a good reminder. Everybody go give Pops a call. Yo, good night, Wooly. So anyway, I've been in the I've been in the struggle. Whether it's uh, you know, your personal situation. Or going for chess uh, goals. I've definitely been in the struggle. I've paid my dues. Is 
Is anyone here for bullet? Any 30 second warriors? I saw a few uh, skinnies lurking. Who are these weebs? That's crazy, chicken pants. That's a wild, wild event. Talk about timing. That's right, Larry Bird's mustache. As we intended. <laughs> bishop A8, literally the worst move. Trapping the bishop. We're trying to get get some of the weebs to give us some action here. Not sure we'll manage. There are a lot of weebs on chess.com, truly. Strong boy. Just realized that he was playing me. Definitely took a while for that to like kick in. Literally the worst move. So unfortunate. Just needed to play Queen uh, F8. But okay, we were a little, uh, a little flustered uh, starting. I didn't realize he was playing me because I was spectating him. So I was like, all of a sudden he's playing me. Kind of like what he just did, honestly.
What are these moves? I don't have any grasp of the position at the moment. This is like really, really wrong. Every move is the wrong kind of energy. Don't know how we won that game. It's one of my worst three second games that I've played. Just like couldn't think about the position. slipped so we can't play the line that we usually play. Shoot. It's my bad. Down a lot of time there. Live bet the draw. Hey, buddy. Thanks for the resub. Should have played night there. Ended up working.
He's up so much time. He's, oops. He's up a lot of time in that game. Way too much. Good game, bad result. Oops, I should have taken that. Yeah, it's unfortunate you play a good game in Hyper, but you lose it. Happens all the time. I wasn't going to be mate there. I was just hoping for some lucky, like, random checkmate, but wasn't going to get it. How did I lose a pawn out of that? <laughs> what the hell?
Yeah, I don't know how we won that endgame. I lost the pawn somehow there. Should have taken here. Completely lost control of the mouse there. We had a chance. Shouldn't have had a chance in that game, but we did. Yeah. You're not moving that uh, that well. Gonna have a bad time. Uh, these are unfortunate. These positions are just disgusting. There's nothing here. Rook should always win that because you can just like cycle which squares you go to. Oh, I didn't even see he moved. Surfer, thanks for the eight months.
Didn't even see the mate. If he had moved, uh, I would have missed it. <laughs> Didn't even see it. It's always nice when your opponent uh, is stronger than you because they see stuff you don't see and <laughs> it helps. In situations like this, at least. Reading's taking a, a hit here. That's a killer. Ah, what are the chances he plays C3? <laughs> C3. Why is he opening the position up? And why am I not playing this? Jesus. Reading is taking a hit. That's gross. Knew we weren't going to win that one. It's not a very good move there. Just a draw. Should be just a draw. This may be playable for him.
Taking that rook was key. <laughs> that was a lucky win. It's a win on the spot there. Rook d8 should be played. Dodged a bullet there for sure. Don't like this at all. Bad position. Okay, a small uh, burst here. He resigned there, I'm not sure why. I would have kept playing. Goodness, dude. That game was doomed. turned into like a very reasonable game. Oof.
If I trade this knight off, then I should be fine. Yeah, the rooks really should beat the queen, but I definitely did not do a very good job proving that. Giving the knight in um, this time control is not usually advised. The knight is always so much nicer to play with than the than the bishop, but I'm gonna get mated here. I feel it. Just down so much time. This is not even close to competitive. Not even close to competitive there. Probably toss that move in just to... That was a nice game. That was a very pro finish.
All right, GG's. Can only do so much of that. And I'm never gonna get 3100 again. He's a good player. GG's, buddy. I know it's Jay Birdie. It's, it's great. You know, I got a guy that uh, resigns. I'll take it. Obviously, I would be messing up half of these, so <laughs> it's good for me. Beep beep, I'm a Jeep. Thanks for the $10. Hey, glad you're liking the habits. I'm glad it found uh, someone out there. I've been hearing some good feedback on it, but um, thanks for sharing yours. Yeah, little streamer trick. Start at 3100, lose a bunch of games, and then get back to 3100 and celebrate it. Woo! Lost some rating. Woo! Made 3100. <laughs> All right, guys. I'm out for today. Shorter, shorter one today. Sunday, and after three days of candidates, I think we all need a little bit of a rest day. Myself, for sure. I'm going to go probably have some good food. And uh, take it easy. I'm going to go talk to my dad. Make sure to do that. Happy Father's Day. Especially if there are any fathers here in chat. Thanks for watching. Um, rest day tomorrow. I'll be doing commentary on the chess.com channel. All right, so you can find me there. I'll be doing some commentary on the I Am Not a GM Speed Chess Championship match. I think I'll be commenting with Jeffrey Zhong. And I'll be back doing... Uh, more candidates, wrap-up, recap, analysis, coverage um, around like 12 to 1 p.m. Eastern back on, what'll it be? Tuesday, because we have a off day tomorrow. All right, so I'll see you guys then. Lots of uh, busy, busy stuff upcoming. Eric's also just getting back from his trip, so we'll probably see him back around the stream some more, okay? See you guys. And uh, let's send the raid off somewhere nice. There's a lot of people streaming right now. Oh, look, uh, Hickey's streaming. Let's send the raid off to Anna Cramling.